Chapter Two of Triplanetary. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Triplanetary, by Edward E. Smith, Chapter Two, in Roger's Planetoid. In the hall, Clio glanced around her wildly, her bosom heaving, eyes darting here and there, seeking even the narrowest avenue of escape. Before she could act, however, her body was clamped inflexibly, as though in a vise, and she struggled motionless. "'It is useless to attempt to escape, or to do anything except what Roger wishes.' The guide informed her somberly, snapping off the instrument in her hand, and thus restoring to the thoroughly cowed girl her freedom of motion. "'His lightest wish is law,' she continued as they walked down a long corridor, the sooner you realize that you must do exactly as he pleases, in all things, the easier your life will be. "'But I wouldn't want to keep on living,' Clio declared, with a flash of spirit. "'And I can always die, you know.' "'You will find that you cannot,' the passionless creature returned, monotonously. "'If you do not yield, you will long and pray for death, but you will not die unless Roger wills it.' I was like you once. I also struggled, and I became what I am now, whatever it is. Here is your apartment. You will stay here until Roger gives further orders concerning you." The living automaton opened a door and stood silent and impassive, while Clio, staring at her in unutterable horror, shrank past her and into the sumptuously furnished suite. The door closed soundlessly, and utter silence descended as a pall. Not an ordinary silence, but the indescribable perfection of the absolute, complete absence of all sound. In that silence Clio stood motionless, tense and rigid, hopeless, despairing. She stood there in that magnificent room, fighting an almost overwhelming impulse to scream. Suddenly she heard the cold voice of Roger, speaking from the empty air. "'You are overwrought, Miss Marsden.' You can be of no use to yourself or to me in that condition. I command you to rest, and to ensure that rest, you may pull that cord which will establish about this room an ether wall, a wall cutting off even this my voice. The voice ceased as she pulled the cord savagely, and threw herself upon a divan in a torrent of gasping, strangling, but rebellious sobs. Then again came a voice, but not to her ears deep within her, pervading every bone and muscle, it made itself felt rather than heard. Cleo, it asked, don't talk yet. Conway, she gasped in relief, every fibre of her being thrilled into new hope at the deep, well-remembered voice of Conway Costigan. Keep still, he snapped. Don't act so happy. He may have a spy ray on you. He can't hear me but he may be able to hear you. When he was talking to you, you must have noticed a sort of rough, sandpapery feeling under that necklace I gave you. Since he's got an ether wall around you, the beads are dead now. If you feel anything like that under the wristwatch, breathe deeply, twice. If you don't feel anything there, it's safe for you to talk as loud as you please. "'I don't feel a thing, Conway,' she rejoiced. Tears forgotten, she was her old, buoyant self again. So that wall is real, after all. I only about half believed it. Don't trust it too much, because he can cut it off from the outside any time he wants to. Remember what I told you. That necklace will warn you of any spy ray in the ether, and the watch will detect anything below the level of the ether. It's dead now, of course, since our three phones are direct connected. I'm in touch with Bradley, too. Don't be too scared. We've got a lot better chance than I thought we had. What? You don't mean it? Absolutely. I'm beginning to think that maybe we've got something he doesn't know exists, our ultra-wave. Of course, I wasn't surprised when his searches failed to find our instruments, but it never occurred to me that I might have a clear field to use them in. I can't quite believe it yet. 
but I haven't been able to find any indication that he can even detect the bands we are using. I'm going to look around over there with my spy ray. I'm looking at you now. Feel it? Yes, the watch feels that way now. Fine. Not a sign of interference over here, either. I can't find a trace of ultra-wave. Anything below ether level, you know. Anywhere in the whole place. He's got so much stuff that we've never heard of, that I supposed of course he'd have ultra-wave, too. But if he hasn't, that gives us the edge. Well, Bradley and I've got a lot of work to do. Wait a minute. I just had a thought. I'll be back in about a second. There was a brief pause. Then the soundless but clear voice went on. "'Good hunting. That woman that gave you the blue willies isn't alive. She's full of the prettiest machinery and communicators you ever saw.' "'Oh, Conway!' And the girl's voice broke in an engulfing wave of thanksgiving and relief. "'It was so unutterably horrible, thinking of what must have happened to her and to others like her.' "'He's running a colossal bluff, I think.' He's good all right, but he lacks quite a lot of being omnipotent. But don't get too cocky, either. Plenty has happened to plenty of women here, and men, too, and plenty may happen to us unless we put out a few jets. Keep a stiff upper lip, and if you want us, yell. Bye. The silent voice ceased. The watch upon Cleo's wrist again became an unobtrusive timepiece, and Costigan, in his solitary cell far below her tower-room, turned his peculiarly goggled eyes toward other scenes. In his pockets his hands manipulated tiny controls, and through the lenses of those goggles Koskin's keen and highly trained eyes studied every concealed detail of mechanism of the great globe, and the while he planned what must be done. Finally, he took off the goggles and spoke in a low voice to Bradley, confined in another windowless room across the hall. I think I've got dope enough, Captain. I've found out where he put our armor and guns, and I've located all the main leads, controls, and generators. There are no ether walls around us here, but every door is shielded, and there are guards outside our doors, one to each of us. They're robots, not men. That makes it harder, since they're undoubtedly connected direct to Roger's desk, and will give an alarm at the first hint of abnormal performance. We can't do a thing until he leaves his desk. See that black panel, a little below the cord switch to the right of your door? That's the conduit cover. When I give you the word, tear that off and you'll see one red wire in the cable. It feeds the shield generator of your door. Break that wire and join me out in the hall. Sorry I had only one of these ultra-wave spies, but once we're together it won't be so bad. Here's what I thought we could do and he went over in detail the only course of action which his surveys had shown to be possible. "'There! He's left his desk!' Costigan exclaimed after the conversation had continued for almost an hour. "'Now as soon as we find out where he's going, we'll start something. "'He's going to see Cleo, the swine. This changes things, Bradley.' His hard voice was a curse. "'Somewhat!' blazed the captain. I know how you two have been getting on all during the cruise. I'm with you. But what can we do? We'll do something, Costigan declared grimly. If he makes a pass at her, I'll get him if I have to blow this whole sphere out of space, with us in it. Don't do that, Conway. Cleo's low voice, trembling but determined, was felt by both men, and both gasped audibly. They had forgotten that there were three instruments in the circuit. If there's a chance for you to get away and do anything about fighting him, don't mind me. Maybe he only wants to talk about the ransom, anyway. He wouldn't talk ransom to you. He's going to talk something else entirely, Costigan gritted. Then his voice changed suddenly. But say, maybe it's just as well this way. They didn't find our specials when they searched us, you know, and we're going to do plenty of damage right soon now. Roger probably isn't a fast worker. More the cat-and-mouse type, I'd say. And after we get started, he'll have something on his mind besides you. Think you can stall him off and keep him interested for about fifteen minutes? I'm sure I can. I'll do anything to help us, or you, get away from this horrible— 
her voice ceased as Roger broke the ether wall of her apartment and walked toward the divan upon which she crouched in wide-eyed, helpless, trembling terror. "'Get ready, Bradley,' Costigan directed tersely. He's left Clio's ether wall off, so that any abnormal signals would be relayed to him from his desk. He knows that there's no chance of anyone disturbing him in that room. But I'm holding my beam on that switch. It's as good a conductor as metal, so that the wall is on full strength. No matter what we do now, he can't get a warning. I'll have to hold the beam exactly on the switch, though, so you'll have to do the dirty work. Tear out that red wire and kill those two guards. You know how to kill a robot, don't you? Yes. Break his eye lenses and his eardrums, and he'll stop whatever he's doing, and send out distress calls. Got em both. Now what? Open my door. The shield switch is to the right. Costigan's door flew open, and the triplanetary captain leaped into the room. Now for our armor, he cried. Not yet snapped Costigan. He was standing rigid, goggled eyes, staring immovably at a spot upon the ceiling. "'I can't move a millimeter until we've closed Clio's ether-wall switch. If I take this ray off it for a second, we're sunk. Five floors up, straight ahead, down a corridor, fourth door on the right. When you're at the switch, you'll feel my ray on your watch. Snap it up!' "'Right!' And the captain leaped away at a pace to be equaled by few men of half his years." Soon he was back, and after Costigan had tested the ether wall of the bridal suite, to make sure that no warning signal from his desk or his servants could reach Roger within it, the two officers hurried away toward the room in which their discarded space armor had been stored. "'Too bad they don't wear uniforms,' panted Bradley, short of breath from the many flights of stairs. "'Might have helped some as disguise.' "'I doubt it.' With so many robots around, they've probably got signals that we couldn't understand anyway. If we meet anybody, it'll mean a battle. Hold it! Peering through walls with his spy ray, Costigan had seen two men approaching, blocking an intersecting corridor into which they must turn. Two of them, a man and a robot. The robot's on your side. We'll wait here, right at the corner. When they round it, take them. And Costigan put away his goggles in readiness for strife. All unsuspecting, the two pirates came into view, and as they appeared the two officers struck. Costigan, on the inside, drove a short, hard right low into the human pirate's abdomen. The fiercely driven fist sank to the wrist into the soft tissues, and the stricken man collapsed. But even as the blow landed, Costigan had seen that there was a third enemy, following close behind the two he had been watching, a pirate who was even then training a ray projector upon him. Reacting automatically, Costigan swung his unconscious opponent around in front of him, so that it was into that insensible body that the vicious ray tore, and not into his own. Crouching down into the smallest possible compass, he straightened his powerful body with a lashing force of a mighty steel spring, hurling the corpse straight at the flaming mouth of the projector. The weapon crashed to the floor, and dead pirate, and living, went down in a heap. Upon that heap Costigan hurled himself, feeling for the enemy's throat. But the pirate had wriggled clear, and countered with a gouging thrust that would have torn out the eyes of a slower man, following it up instantly with a savage kick for the groin. No automaton this, geared and set to perform a certain fixed duty with mechanical precision, but a lithe, strong man in hard training, fighting with every foul trick known to his murderous ilk. But Costigan was no tyro in the art of dirty fighting. Few indeed are the maiming tricks of foul combat unknown to even the rank and file of the highly efficient secret service of the Triplanetary League, and Costigan, a sector chief of that unknown organization, knew them all. Not for pleasure, sportsmanship, nor million-dollar purses do those secret agents use nature's weapons. They come to grips only when it cannot possibly be avoided but when they are forced to fight in that fashion they go into it with but one grim purpose, to kill, and to kill in the shortest possible space of time. Thus it was that Costigan's opening soon came. The pirate launched a particularly vicious kick, the dreaded coup de sabot, which Costigan avoided by a lightning shift. It was a slight shift, barely enough to make the kicker miss, 
and two powerful hands closed upon that flying foot in mid-air like the sprung jaws of a bear-trap, closed and twisted viciously in the same fleeting instant. There was a shriek, smothered as a heavy boot crashed to its carefully predetermined mark. The pirate was out, definitely and permanently. The struggle had lasted scarcely ten seconds, coming to its close just as Bradley finished blinding and deafening the robot. Costigan picked up the projector, again donned his spy-ray goggles, and the two hurried on. "'Nice work, Chief. It must be a gift to roughhouse the way you do,' Bradley exclaimed. "'That's why you took the live one?' "'Practice helps some, too. I've been in brawls before, and I'm a lot younger and maybe some faster than you are,' Costigan explained briefly, penetrant gaze rigidly to the fore as they ran along one corridor after another. Several more guards, both living and mechanical, were encountered on the way, but they were not permitted to offer any opposition. Costigan saw them first. In the furious beam of the projector of the dead pirate they were riven into nothingness, and the two officers sped on to the room which Costigan had located from afar. The three suits of triplanetary space armor had been sealed into a cabinet whose doors Costigan literally blew off with a blast of force, rather than consume time in tracing the power leads. "'I feel like something now!' Costigan, once more encased in his own armor, heaved a great sigh of relief. "'Rough and tumble's all right with one or two, but that generator room is full of grief, and we won't have any too much stuff as it is. We've got to take Clio's suit along. We'll carry it down to the door of the power room, drop it there, and pick it up after we've wrecked the works.' Contemptuous now of possible guards, the armoured pair strode toward the room which housed the pulsating heart of the immense fortress of space. Guards were encountered, and captains, officers who signalled frantically to their chief, since he alone could unleash the frightful forces at his command, and who profanely wondered at his unwanted silence, but the enemy beams were impotent against the mighty ether walls of that armour and the pirates, without armor in the security of their own planet as they were, vanished utterly in the ravening beams of the twin Lewistons. As they paused before the door of the power-room, both men felt Clio's voice raised in her first and last appeal, an appeal wrung from her against her will by the extremity of her position. "'Conway, hurry! Oh, hurry! I can't last much longer! Good-bye, dear!' In the horror-filled tones both men read clearly the girl's dire extremity. Each saw plainly a happy, carefree young earth-girl, upon her first trip into space, locked inside an ether-wall with an over-brained, under-conscienced human machine, a super-intelligent but lecherous and unmoral mechanism of flesh and blood, acknowledging no authority, ruled by nothing save his own scientific drivings and the almost equally powerful urges of his desires and passions. She had fought with every resource at her command. She had wept and pleaded, she had stormed and raged, she had feigned submission and had played for time, and her torment had not touched in the slightest degree the merciless and gloating brain of the being who called himself Roger. Now his tantalizing, ruthless cat-play was done, the horrible grey-brown face was close to hers, she wailed her final despairing message to Costigan, and attacked that hideous face with the fury of a tigress. Costigan bit off a bitter imprecation. "'Hold him off just a second longer, sweetheart!' he cried, and the power-room door vanished. Through the great room the two Lewistons swept at full aperture and at maximum power, two rapidly opening fans of death and destruction. Here and there a guard, more rapid than his fellows, trained a futile projector, a projector whose magazine exploded at the touch of that frightful field of force, liberating instantaneously its thousands upon thousands of kilowatt-hours of stored-up energy. Through the delicately adjusted, complex mechanisms the destroying beams tore. At their touch armatures burned out, high-tension leads volatilized in crashing, high-voltage sparks, masses of metal smoked and burned in the path of vast forces now seeking the easiest path to neutralization. Delicate instruments blew up, copper ran in streams like water. As the last machine subsided into a semi-molten mass of metal, the two wreckers, each grasping a brace, 
felt themselves become weightless and knew that they had accomplished the first part of their program. Costigan leaped for the outer door. His the task to go to Clio's aid. Bradley would follow more slowly, bringing the girl's armor and taking care of any possible pursuit. As he sailed through the air, he spoke. "'Coming, Clio. All right, girl?' questioningly, half fearfully. "'All right, Conway.' Her voice was almost unrecognizable, broken in retching agony. "'When everything went crazy, he found out that the ether wall was up, forgot all about me. He shut it off, and seemed to go crazy, too. He is floundering around like a wild man now. I'm trying to keep him from going downstairs.' "'Good girl. Keep him busy one minute more. He's getting all the warnings at once, and wants to get back to his board. But what's the matter with you? Did he hurt you, after all?' "'Oh, no, not that. But I'm sick, horribly sick. I'm falling. I'm so dizzy I can scarcely see. My head is breaking up into little pieces. I just know I'm going to die, Conway. Oh! Oh!' "'Oh, is that all?' In his sheer relief that they had been in time, Costigan did not think of sympathizing with Clio's very real present distress of mind and body. "'I forgot that you're a ground-gripper. That's just a little touch of space-sickness. It'll wear off directly. All right, I'm coming. Let go of him and get as far away from him as you can.' He was now in the street. Perhaps two hundred feet distant and a hundred feet above him was the tower-room in which were Clio and Roger. He sprang directly towards its large window, and as he floated upward, he corrected his course and accelerated his pace by firing backward at various angles with his heavy service pistol, uncaring that at the point of impact of each of those shells a small blast of destruction erupted. He missed the window a trifle, but that did not matter. His flaming Lewiston opened a way for him, partly through the window, partly through the wall. As he soared through the opening, he trained projector and pistol upon Roger, now almost to the door, noticing as he did so that Clio was clinging convulsively to a lamp-bracket upon the wall. Door and wall vanished in the Lewiston's terrific beam, but the pirate stood unharmed. Neither ravening ray nor explosive shell could harm him. He had snapped on the protective shield, whose generator was always upon his person. But Roger, while not exactly a ground-gripper, did not know how to handle himself without weight. Whereas Costigan, given six walls against which to push, was even more efficient in weightless combat than when handicapped by the force of gravitation. Keeping his projector upon the pirate, he seized the first club to hand, a long slender pedestal of metal, and launched himself past the pirate chief. With all the momentum of his mass and velocity, and all the power of his mighty right arm, he swung the bar at the pirate's head. That fiercely driven mass of metal should have taken Roger's head from his shoulders, but it did not. That shield of force was utterly rigid and impenetrable. The only effect of the frightful blow was to set him spinning, end over end, like the flying baton of an acrobatic drum-major. As the spinning form crashed against the opposite wall of the room, Bradley floated in, carrying Clio's armor. Without a word, the captain loosened the helpless girl's grip upon the bracket, and encased her in the suit. Then, supporting her at the window, he held his Lewiston upon the captive's head while Costigan propelled him toward the opening. Both men knew that Roger's shield of force must be threatened every instant, that if he were allowed to release it he probably would bring to bear a hand-weapon even superior to their own. Braced against the wall, Costigan sighted along Roger's body toward the most distant point of the lofty dome of the artificial planet, and gave him a gentle push. Then, each grasping Clio by an arm, the two officers shoved mightily with their feet, and the three armored forms darted away toward their only hope of escape, an emergency boat which could be launched through the shell of the great globe. To attempt to reach the Hyperion, and to escape in one of her lifeboats, would have been useless. They could not have forced the great gates of the main airlocks, and no other exits existed. As they sailed onward through the air, Costigan keeping the slowly floating form of Roger enveloped in his beam, Clio began to recover. "'Suppose they get their gravity fixed?' she asked apprehensively. "'And they're raying us and shooting at us.' 
They may have fixed it already. They undoubtedly have spare parts and duplicate generators. But if they turn it on, the fall will kill Roger, too, and he wouldn't like that. They'll have to get him down with an airship, and they know that we'll get them as fast as they come up. They can't hurt us with hand weapons, and before they can bring up any heavy stuff, they'll be afraid to use it, because we'll be too close to their shell. "'I wish we could have brought Roger along,' he continued savagely to Bradley. "'But you were right, of course. It'd be altogether too much like a rabbit capturing a wild cat. My Lewiston's about done right now. There can't be much left of yours. What he'd do to us would be a sin and a shame.' Now at the great wall, the two men heaved mightily upon a lever, the gate of the emergency port swung slowly open, and they entered the miniature cruiser of the void. Costigan, familiar with the mechanism of the craft from careful study from his prison cell, manipulated the controls. Through gate after massive gate they went, until finally they were out in open space, shooting toward distant Tellus at the maximum acceleration of which their small craft was capable. Costigan cut the other two phones out of circuit and spoke, his attention fixed upon some extremely distant point. "'Sams!' he called, sharply. "'Costigan! We're out!' "'All right.' "'Yes.' "'Sure.' "'Absolutely. You tell em, Sammy, I've got company here.' Through the sound discs of their helmets the girl and the captain had heard Costigan's share of the conversation— Bradley stared at his erstwhile first officer in amazement, and even Clio had often heard that mighty, half-mythical name. Surely that bewildering young man must rank high, to speak so familiarly to Virgil Sams, the all-powerful head of the space-pervading secret service of the Triplanetary League. "'They've turned in a general call-out,' Bradley stated rather than asked. "'Long ago. I've been in touch right along.' Costigan answered. Now that they know what to look for, and know that ether wave detectors are useless, they can find it. Every vessel in seven sectors, clear down to the scout patrols, is concentrating on this point, and the call is out for all battleships and cruisers afloat. There are enough operatives out there with ultra waves to locate that globe, and once they spot it, they'll point it out to all the other vessels. But how about the other prisoners? asked the girl. They'll all be killed, won't they? Hard telling, Costigan shrugged. Depends on how things turn out. We lack a lot of being safe ourselves yet, and it's my personal opinion that there's going to be a real war. What's worrying me mostly is our own chance, Bradley assented. They will chase us, of course. Sure, and they'll have more speed than we have. Depends on how far away the nearest triplanetary vessels are. Anyway— We've done everything we can do. It's in the laps of the gods now. Silence fell, and Costigan cut in Clio's phone and came over to the seat upon which she was reclining, white and stricken, worn out by the horrible and terrifying ordeals of the last few hours. As he seated himself beside her, she blushed vividly, but her deep blue eyes met his grey ones steadily. Clio, I... we... you, that is... He flushed hotly, and stopped. This secret agent, whose clear, keen brain no physical danger could cloud, who had proved over and over again that he was never at a loss in any emergency, however desperate, this quick-witted officer floundered in embarrassment like any schoolboy, but continued doggedly. I'm afraid that I gave myself away back there, but— We gave ourselves away, you mean. She filled in the pause. I did my share, but I won't hold you to it if you don't want. But I know that you love me, Conway. Love you, the man groaned, his face lined and hard, his whole body rigid. That doesn't half tell it, Clio. You don't need to hold me. I'm held for life. There never was a woman who meant anything to me before, and there never will be another. You're the only woman that ever existed. It isn't that. Can't you see that it's impossible? Of course I can't. It isn't impossible at all. She released her finger shields, four hands met and tightly clasped, and her low voice thrilled with feeling as she went on. 
you love me and I love you. That is all that matters. I wish it were, Costigan returned bitterly. But you don't know what you'd be letting yourself in for. It's who and what you are and who and what I am that's eating me. You, Cleo Marsden, Curtis Marsden's daughter, nineteen years old. You think you've been places and done things. You haven't. You haven't seen or done anything. You don't know what it's all about. And who am I to love a girl like you? A homeless space flea, who hasn't been on any planet three weeks and three years. A hard-boiled egg. A troubleshooter and a brawler by instinct and training. A sp— He bit off the word and went on quickly. Why, you don't know me at all. And there's a lot of me that you will never know. That I can't let you know. You'd better lay off me, girl while you can. It'll be best for you, believe me." "'But I can't, Conway, and neither can you,' the girl answered softly, a glorious light in her eyes. "'It's too late for that. On the ship it was just another of those things, but since then we've come really to know each other, and we're sunk. The situation is out of control, and we both know it, and neither of us would change it if we could, and you know that, too.' I don't know very much, I admit, but I do know what you thought you'd have to keep from me, and I admire you all the more for it. We all honour the service, Conway, dearest. It is only you men who have made and are keeping the three planets fit places to live in. And I know that Virgil Sam's chief lieutenant would have to be a man in four thousand million. What makes you think that? he demanded sharply. You told me so yourself, indirectly. Who else in the known universe could possibly call him Sammy? You are hard, of course, but you must be so, and I never did like soft men, anyway. And you brawl in a good cause, and you are very much a man, my Conway, a real, real man, and I love you. Now, if they catch us all right, we'll die together at least," she finished passionately. "'You're right, sweetheart, of course,' he admitted. I don't believe that I could really let you let me go, even though I know you ought to." And their hands locked together even more firmly than before. "'If we ever get out of this jam, I'm going to kiss you, but this is no time to be taking off your helmet. In fact, I'm taking too many chances with you and keeping your finger-shields off. Snap em on, Cleo mine. The pirates ought to be getting fairly close by this time." Hands released, and armor again tight. Costigan went over to join Bradley at the control board. "'How are they coming, Captain?' he asked. "'Not so good. Quite a ways off yet. At least an hour, I'd say, before a cruiser can get within range. "'I'll see if I can locate any of the pirates chasing us. If I do, it'll be by accident. This little spy ray isn't good for much except close work. I'm afraid the first warning we'll have will be when they take hold of us with a beam or spear us with a ray.' probably a beam, though. This is one of their emergency lifeboats, and they wouldn't want to destroy it unless they have to. Also, I imagine that Roger wants us alive pretty badly. He has unfinished business with all three of us, and I can well believe that his not particularly pleasant extinction will be even less so after the way we rooked him. "'I want you to do me a favor, Conway.' Cleo's face was white with horror at the thought of facing again that unspeakable creature of grey. "'Give me a gun or something, please. I don't want him to touch me again while I'm alive.' "'He won't,' Costigan assured her, narrow of eye and grim of jaw. He was, as she had said, hard. "'But you don't want a gun. You might get nervous and use it too soon. I'll take care of you at the last possible moment because if he gets hold of us, we won't stand a chance of getting away again." For minutes there was silence, Costigan surveying the ether in all directions with his ultra-wave device. Suddenly he laughed, deeply and with real enjoyment, and the others stared at him in surprise. <laughs> "'No, I'm not crazy,' he told them. "'This is really funny. It had never occurred to me that all these pirate ships are invisible to any ether wave so long as they're using power. I can see them, of course, with this sub-ether spy, but they can't see us. I knew that they should have overtaken us before this. 
I finally found them. They've passed us, and are now tacking around, waiting for us to cut off our power for a minute so they can see us. They're heading right into the fleet. They think they're safe, of course, but what a surprise they've got coming to them! But it was not only the pirates who were to be surprised. Long before the pirate ship had come within extreme visibility range of the triplanetary fleet, it lost its invisibility and was starkly outlined upon the lookout plates of the three fugitives. For a few seconds the pirate craft seemed unchanged, then it began to glow redly, with a red that seemed to become darker as it grew stronger. Then the sharp outlines blurred, puffs of air burst outward, and the metal of the hull became a viscous fluid like something, flowing away in a long red streamer into seemingly empty space. Koskin turned his ultra-gaze into that space, and saw that it was actually far from empty. There lay a vast something, formless and indefinite either to his sub-ethereal vision, a something into which the viscid stream of transformed metal plunged, plunged, and vanished. Powerful interference blanketed his ultra-wave and howled throughout his body, but in the hope that some part of his message might get through he called Sam's, and calmly and clearly he narrated everything that had just happened. He continued his crisp report, neglecting not the smallest detail, while their tiny craft was drawn inexorably toward a redly impermeable veil, and continued it until their lifeboat, still intact, shot through that veil and he found himself unable to move. He was conscious, he was breathing normally, his heart was beating, but not a voluntary muscle would obey his will. End of chapter.